Hey, all right, we're going to get started. Uh, just a second here, the uh, choir's done. They'll all be joining us here in a second. So if you've been around this ministry for a while, which a lot of you have, if you haven't, you know, I, every once in a while I like to quiz you on what's our motto, but it's on the screen there, pursuing purpose. And we do it through God's word, God's people, and God's work. And one of the things that I believe is that when you're going to do God's work, our job, if you read Ephesians, which uh, pastor's preaching through, and he's going to hit it in a couple weeks, our job as ministers and pastors and shepherds and teachers is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to get you in a place where you can go out and you can serve other people. It's doing God's work. But I also realize that sometimes that means that we get to give you opportunities to do God's work, and we're going to be doing some of those things in class. We've done service projects, we've just like we do with the, the mission strip, the clothing drives, which we'll be doing another one here real soon, different ways that we can find out to serve and minister to our community. And by doing that, it's equipping you to go out and fulfill the purposes that God has for you. So sometimes our job is not to say, hey, I'm equipping you to go do this. It's to provide opportunities. And Shadow Mountain is very big on that and giving people opportunities. And today was no different. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker's name is Matt Rampy. Matt, you can come on up here. Matt, you're in the D.C. area, right? And Matt's a friend of uh, friends of Shadow Mountain. He's got a lot of people here he's connected with. And your work, you're doing Dallas Seminary, right? Yes. That's right. So this, so this whole message is going to alliterate, right? Everything's going to start with the same. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, he's like, maybe. Uh, anyway. He's got, he's got friends and family that he's connected to here, and that's why that we've got the, the peanut gallery. Troy said he would not make any weird faces at you <laughs> during the message. That's, never mind. It, what's that? He just, he just did, yep, yep, yep. Anyway, so we want to give, uh, Matt, God is calling Matt into ministry, and, he, and, and as you know, and you go into that, having opportunities to, to express your gifts and use those things is so important. And because we believe in pursuing purpose and giving people the opportunity to use their gifts and, and, and equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, Matt's going to come and share with us today. And you'll be preaching on Colossians, right? Which yes. I love that book. So uh, he's got the notes in there. We've got discussion questions. These are all from Matt today. So I know that you'll give him a your undivided attention as you do. And let's give Matt a warm welcome as you come to share with us today. Thank you, Pastor George. Thank you guys. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you all. Can you hear me okay through the microphone? Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to pray real quick and then we'll get into it. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for um, everyone you've brought here today. Thank you for your word that it is alive and active. I pray that it would uh, pierce through to our hearts today. Um, that it would convict of things for us, that it would encourage and affirm in areas that we need it, um, and that it would call us to areas where we need to grow in our uh, relationship with you. We give you this time, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, quick show of hands. How many people like exercise? It doesn't just have to be the gym, but sports, any active activity? Okay, most of you. Nice. Well, me and my, lo me and my wife, we love uh, exercise. Um, it's not always fun, but we, we have a hobby where we'll, we'll work out together. And, uh, you know, I like it because it refreshes me. It kind of gets me in a good headspace. It clears my mind. Um, it's kind of a good reset, too, for, for managing stress. And I'm sure you guys have probably experienced that as well. So I like it so much that I took a class in college. Um, really, I just took it because it was basically like high school PE and an easy A in, in my gen eds. So um, I'm not going to lie to you. Now, uh, this class, we had a teacher, uh, he was a young guy, very fit and active, and uh, he, would, he would challenge us. So he wanted us to always, to, to push us to do more, and he would find creative ways to do that. Um, some of his tactics were, were a little questionable, and, and we'll get into that, but one day he comes into class, it's still towards the beginning of the semester, and uh, he, he asks us, he says, hey, we're going to do, do a planking challenge today. And uh, he, he always puts something in front of it, not just hit your personal best, but if you do something, there's going to be a, if, if one of you achieves this goal, the whole class gets rewarded. So he says, if someone can do four minutes without dropping, uh, you, don't, you don't have to do any running the rest of the semester. Class just started, so we're all like, we all hate running. We're like, yes, let's do this. So everyone's feeling good about themselves. I'm like, I don't know. Like, I've done, I've done some workouts and, and timed myself with a plank before, and I, I got to like two and a half minutes, and I thought I was going to die. So uh, I'm thinking, how are we going to get to four minutes? We had a guy on the football team. Maybe he'll do it. So sure enough, he gets us all ready. We get into our planking position. He's got the timer around his neck, and he starts it. 
So we have no concept of time. We don't know how long we've been doing this. Everyone's kind of talking and laughing, saying, oh, this is easy. And then he tells them, hey, only 30 seconds have passed. And then everyone kind of is getting serious. So uh, <laughs> people start to drop slowly. And then there's a few of us get past the minute mark a little bit longer. And soon enough, people are dropping like flies. And uh, eventually, I look around, and I realize that I'm the last guy left. And I'm like, oh, man. Because I don't know how much time is left, but I just know that everyone's around me. They're like, you cannot drop, because if you do, we have to run the rest of the semester. And they're like shouting at me. I think they're cheering for me, but I think they just want to get the, the free pass on running. So uh, my body is violently shaking and trembling, and he's not giving me a count of time. And then eventually, he starts a 10-second countdown. And at this point, I'm like, there's no way I'm dropping. So he does the 10-second countdown, gets to zero. My body collapses, hits the floor. And everyone's cheering. And uh, the story isn't as, as great as it sounds because he then says, good job, buddy, but I had my fingers crossed behind my back when I proposed the challenge, so you all still have to run all semester long. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, I don't think I can trust this guy anymore. Um, and today what we're, we're going to be looking at is Colossians 3, uh, 1 through 17. So you can turn there, Colossians 3, 1 through 17. Um, the Apostle Paul has a lot to say in this letter. There's lots of things he needs to say, that he wants to say, that the Holy Spirit has put on his heart uh, to communicate to these people. Uh, but what we're going to be looking at today and what we want to focus on is two things. We want to look at what does it mean to trust God with our lives and how do we do that? So I'll give you guys a minute just to turn there. All right. And uh, just a quick summary as well. So I found this interesting statement. In the, it's in the back of just uh, my Bible here that kind of tries to summarize the book. And here's what it says. He, meaning Paul, explains that the right way of living in this world is to focus on heavenly rather than earthly things. God's chosen people must leave their sinful lives behind and live in a godly way, looking to Christ as the head of the church. And I think that's a really good summary because it summarizes uh, not just the whole book, but specifically chapter 3, where, where we're going to be today. So I'm going to go ahead and read that for us. Just give me one second. All right. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, too, you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So in the first two verses, and we're going to have three main points. Here's the first one. The first key to trusting God is keeping your vision vertical. And there's kind of this idea of horizontal vision versus vertical vision. And I like this picture because it's kind of, he's looking horizontally, but he has a vertical focus. He sees beyond, right? There's a, there's a greater purpose that he's living for. He's not kind of just walking through life aimlessly. And what's interesting about Paul is he has a lot of different things, I think, that come to mind for us, right? That when we think about Paul and his letters that he's written, 
Uh, but, but one thing that I've kind of noticed as I've gone through his different letters is he seems to have a really heavy focus on, on the mind, on the perspective. And I think that's important because everything he does flows from that. His actions, his desires, the things he does with his life. And in a greater sense, right, this is, a, um, this is an unseen hope that he's talking about here. So, sorry, one second. <clears throat> So Paul, right, he's a man who's, uh, he's gone through a lot. He's, he's suffered um, beatings and persecutions. He's writing this letter from prison. And really, he's, he's long-suffering, right? He's enduring with patience. There's no end in sight. He doesn't know when that time will be and what the next step is. Yeah, he thinks God is calling him home soon. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of emotion there. So I think when he wrote these words, uh, he meant it because he was, he was trained by these words, right? And... Um, the question is, how does somebody make it through life when, there's no, when, when you don't know what the end goal is or what the end is in sight? And Paul says it's simple, right? You keep your mind on Christ. You focus your mind there. It's from that place that trust is born, right? It's from that place that you can have true and lasting patience to endure with something you might be going through in your life. And um, you say, okay, well, how do I do that and why? Well, when you know who God is, what he's done for you, and the promises that he's made for you, that's where that that hope comes from, right? That gives you a patience that's fueled by hope. Let's look at Romans uh, 8, 23 and 25. It says, And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So you remember the story from the beginning, right? What was different about that time versus the other times I've worked out? Well, first, there was no timer in front of me. So isn't it amazing how if you don't have a preconceived notion of what the limits are on yourself, that you can do so much more than you ever thought? I never would have thought I could do four minutes. And, and, and here's the thing. In a, in a spiritual sense, how much greater? When we, when we don't have those blockers, right? When we don't have these preconceived notions and limits of things we can do or how long-suffering we can be when we're enduring a trial. And so I think, I think that's what Paul's getting at here, right? There's an unseen hope, and yet it's still certain. And that's really what powers us to trust God with our lives. And so if we can't see where something's going to end, uh, that should drive us into greater dependence upon God. We should lean into God and trust him more. And that's really what's going to strengthen us in our daily walk with him. Now, I I don't know what each of you is going through. Maybe you're struggling with a season of loneliness or depression, maybe anxiety. Maybe it's just the comparison trap of social media, right? Just scrolling through the feed. Everyone has a perfect life but you. Uh, Whatever the case may be, those are things where you've probably maybe cried out and said, God, I, I don't know how much longer I can do this. I don't know what I'm doing here. What is my purpose? I don't know that I feel called to something. And he's saying, no, 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 you, you can. This is, this is what you can do. You can trust in me. You can hope in me. So clinging to this. The second piece is I was in community. I don't, I, I, you know, if, if I exercise and I'm by myself, I don't feel as motivated as when there's people around me saying, come on, you got this, and when I can also cheer them on. And I think that's what, what we need to do, right? We need to be able to live in community. That's going to strengthen our trust in God. That's going to strengthen our faith. Now, have you ever noticed this? It seems like when the world is kind of just crumbling down uh, around you, maybe your circumstances are really difficult and you just have this tunnel vision for Jesus. Like maybe you have a really good season in your life and, and you're just locked in and you kind of have that vertical vision. Doesn't it feel like you're unstoppable? Like, you, like it doesn't matter what the storm is around you, that God's going to bring you through it. There's kind of that peace in the middle of the chaos. And I think that's, that's what we're after here. So it's kind of like this inex, inexplainable peace that overcomes us, right? All the anxieties and the worries, they melt away. And we know that we're going to be able to endure through that. And he's going to bring us through the other side because we've seen him faithful time and again through his word and in our lives. Second point, trust requires selflessness. Trust requires selflessness. So what do all these things have in common when he says sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk? It's sin, right? It's all sin. And I think at its core, sin is really just selfishness, right? There's a battle going on between the flesh and the spirit. And the flesh within us is pulling our heart's desires toward ourselves, towards these things that we think are going to please us and bring us fulfillment and joy in this world. The Spirit, on the other hand, right, is pulling our heart's desires toward God and toward others. And then that's really where the true fulfillment comes. And that's where trust is strengthened. So if we're able to deny our earthly desires, right, and say, 
God, I trust that your way is better than mine and exercise that act of trust, we see the reward over time. And when, when, when our desires change, right, when our desires start to align with God's desires, we can't stay the same. So here's an example. Let's look at Psalm 37.4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I love this verse. In, in verse 5, it goes on to talk about trust as well. But notice the order here. First delight in the Lord, then the desires come. So when you trust God, when you're pursuing him, what happens? Your heart becomes his heart. Your desires become his desires. And all of a sudden, you're living this life where it just feels very fulfilling, right? Let's go ahead to the next final point here. Trust requires something new. Trust requires something new. What do I mean by that? Trust requires change. It requires obedience to God. And here's the deal. When we understand who God is and how much he loves us and the, and the promises he has for us, then we start to obey because we love him, not because it's an obligation or because we feel like we have to. So those motivations of the heart, those are two very different things. So as we talk about it today as well, it's good for us to kind of assess where our heart is at in that. Let's look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. Here's an example. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So how can we say we believe God and we love him and we're following him with our whole life when our acts and our walk doesn't match our talk, if we're living in a disobedient way towards him? And I think that's really confusing for the world around us too. That's lost and searching when they see that our walk doesn't match our talk. In the scriptures, Paul's explained to these believers, uh, you can't just tell yourself not to do something, right? You have to replace it with something new. There's a really obscure story. It's like three verses long in Matthew chapter 12, where he talks about uh, this man who was possessed by a demon, and the demon flees the man, right? He's delivered, and the demon is off wandering in some desert, and he's wanting to come back. He brings seven more spirits, more evil than the first, they see the place is clean and swept and empty, and then he's possessed again, and, and the situation is way worse than what it was the first time. And I think the idea is, if we're going to trust God, if we're going to obey his commands and put off the old, we have to put on the new, right? We have to replace it with these things he's talking about. And so if we don't, the situation will be worse than what it is. So, it, you know, if, if it's something where you're struggling with uh, pornography, and you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to quit that, and it's gone— but are you filling the void in your heart with Christ? Because if you're not, something else is going to tug on the desires of your heart and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be there. So let's look at uh, verses 15 and 16 again where it says, <clears throat> And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. So it's, it's beautiful because when we're able to trust God, when we truly know him and we're pursuing him, his peace is, is resting in our hearts, right? It's sitting on the throne of our hearts. We're no longer being swayed by our emotions. We're able to say, God, I, I can't see right now, or I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, my desires are pulling me here, but I surrender them to you. There's this deep trust that gives you a lot of clarity in your life. And from that, it produces gratitude. Now, my wife and I, we have this little phrase uh, we use to hold each other accountable, and uh, it's kind of around this idea with peace and anxiety. And it's, uh, we'll say, for example, let's say I'm getting worried about something in my life. And she'll say, remember, what if, not what if, or sorry, remember, <laughs> remember what is, not what if. And the idea is, you know, most of our thoughts when I'm worried is, starts with what if. And then fear starts to come in saying, well, what if this happens? What if it doesn't work out that way? What if I'm not where God has, am I, has me, where I'm supposed to be right now? Instead, focusing on what is, what does God's word say? What does God say about me? What does he say about my identity? What does he say about my purpose and the life he's given me? And out of that is where the peace comes. Um, once we're able to meditate on Christ and focus on that, I feel like that's a place where trust can become a powerful, powerful virtue in our lives. And I think uh, just to kind of resum up the three points here, we have keeping our ver vision vertical, trust requiring selflessness, and then trust requiring something new, replacing the old with the new. I think verse uh, 17 kind of sums everything up really well. I'm going to reread it real quick here. 
And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So I think from this place, right, our lives are becoming ruled by the peace of Christ in that it produces in us thankfulness and then gratitude, right, which then leads to a life that's completely devoted to him um, in all that we do, right? This is verse 17, in everything that we do. Uh, and, but none of this ever happens if we don't trust God. If we don't know who God is and trust his character, there's, there's no starting point to go from here. So let me pray that we would trust him. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. And thank you for your truth. 